I'd like to welcome you to this session co-sponsored by the Cal Assessment Network and the Business Process Analysis Working Group. My name is Katie Dustin and I'm the chair of CAN. The co-chairs of BPOG are Sierra White and Isaac Mankita. Wave Sierra and Isaac. We all hope that you and your family are safe and well. We also hope that this meeting will help you to still feel connected to your communities of practice. As a reminder, the session is being recorded so that those who could not join us live can review the event later. I'd like to take a moment to remind you all of the next CAN session coming up in two days. It is called Bringing Your Innovative Idea to Life, Creating and Assessing Pilot Projects. It's being offered by the Berkeley People and Culture Achieve Together team. While I put the details about the session into the chat window, let me toss it over to my colleague, Sierra. Hello, everyone. I hope you're well. Um, I have the pri Hi, Angela. <laughs> I have the privilege of introducing uh, our speaker today, who is Eugene Whitlock. He is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for People and Culture and the Chief People and Culture Officer here at UC Berkeley. Um, Eugene has been in that role about six months, and prior to that role, he served as Vice Chancellor of Human Resources and General Counsel of the San Mateo uh, County Community College, sorry, San Mateo County Community College District, that's a mouthful, um, which serves about uh, 45,000 students across three colleges. Eugene led the district's equity-focused recruitment, which resulted in the increased hiring of staff and faculty from underrepresented backgrounds. He championed professional development opportunities for employees, developed workshops, and training on harassment and discrimination. He led efforts to support faculty and staff in order to increase, or increase and enhance employee experience. Prior to joining the Community College District, uh, Eugene worked in legal investment banking and project management roles in the US, Germany and Japan and Venezuela. And he is a fluent speaker of Spanish and German. Uh, thank you so much, Eugene, for taking time out of your day to chat with us a little bit more about the uh, employee morale survey. And I'll hand it over to you now. Oh, I think we need to unmute Eugene. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> and if somebody can make me a co-host so I can share my screen, I'll be able to share a little presentation I put together for the, uh, to talk through the employee survey. I believe Isaac is working, that on, working on that on the background. Isaac has already done it. Great. He's a wish, hey, all Isaac. right. <laughs> Let me get to it. Please bear with me. There we go. All right, well, thank you everybody for having me. First of all, I see that there's a lot of people on there, so I will not spend too much time just talking myself to allow people to ask questions. But the survey, for a little background, so we were planning to do an employee survey before the whole COVID-19 thing happened. And then it happened, and so we had to shift gears and I was doing a campus conversation live stream with the chancellor and a couple of other folks. And I was asked, how do you think our employees are doing? And, they, and I said, from my perspective, from what people tell me, people seem to be doing okay. But then on the simultaneous Twitter feed, people said essentially, Eugene has lost his mind. He doesn't know what's going on. And so I said, but we're gonna do a survey to, to find out. And so that's where this survey came from. Hopefully most, if not all of you participated in the survey. I did personally read all 5,000 comments that people provided and I felt it was important to do that because although the data and the hard numbers tell you a lot, the, the real stories are in the comments and for me it was like an opportunity to have quick conversations with 5,000 of my colleagues which is something I would never really have the opportunity to do. It took a long time but it was well worth it because now I think I have a better sense of how people are really feeling. So I'll run through the, the overall responses and spend some time talking about what it is we decided as a university to do in response to the information that everybody provided us. I also have some funny cartoons in here because everybody seems to be very serious nowadays. So hopefully people can chuckle a little bit too. I find that my sense of humor is coming out more every day as I have to sit here talking on these video calls and I see no reaction. I don't know if people find me funny or not, but I'm gonna do it anyway. 
All right. So we'll start out with a cartoon. And this cartoon, I think, is somewhat reflective of my own experience at home because there were times where my, my littlest child wanted to sit on my shoulders while I tried to work at my computer. And I, and I would have to say I, I was not very effective. For those of you who don't know, I have three children, five, four, and one. So for those parents who've been struggling trying to work and manage their children, I completely understand. When I was asked, what is it that you want to do when this is all over? I said, I want to get away from my kids. I love my kids. I love spending time with my kids. But you know, there is quality time, and then there's just too much time. I want to get back to that quality time sort of feeling. All right, so our first question that we asked was, how are you feeling in general? And as you can see, more than half the campus is doing OK or better. And I, I was surprised that this question came out so positive. We're going to run the survey again in, in mid-May um, so, so that we can see, continue to monitor how people are feeling. But what jumped out to me and caused me more concern, of course, was the number of people who are feeling not so great and bad. We had a 40% response rate to this survey sent to faculty and staff. So I think this is pretty representative of the campus as a whole. And so when we were thinking about what kind of interventions can we provide, it was really targeted at the folks who aren't doing so great and who are feeling bad, because those are the members of our community who need the most support. We can't provide people babysitters. We can't reopen their schools. But what are the? But we were asking ourselves and reading the comments to understand what are the things that we actually can do. You know, this shows how many people went from working completely in the office to working at home. And so, 72% of the people went from all of a sudden I'm at work to all of a sudden I'm at home. And so that's a huge transition and a huge number of people to just all of a sudden have to do that in any organization. Next strike here, this is a commentary on our society's view of teachers. So on the left, you have a, a disgruntled parent telling the teacher who is on strike that you're just a babysitter, a glorified babysitter. But now post COVID, we have the parent throwing as much money as possible at the teacher as his children scream at him. And so I think probably a lot of us have a greater appreciation for how hard it is to sit with these little kids all day. It's one thing to do it on a Saturday and Sunday when you're going to activities, which itself is tiring, but when you have to actually do it all day, every day, and keep them engaged, and not just in front of the iPad, which I've done, I'll admit, I've done, and it's very effective, but you feel guilty about it. Do you have the equipment needed to perform your work remotely? Almost 85% say yes. This question, I think when people answer it, you know, some people might think, yeah, I have my laptop. Yeah, you can perform your work, but a laptop is not enough, right? So I think now people are hitting the point where they're hunched over the little screen all day. They're starting to have eye strain, their neck, their shoulders, their back hurts, their wrists are starting to hurt. One of the comments somebody stated that they are able to work on their laptop all day, but they're in so much pain at the end of the day, they have to take Advil and ice so that they can continue to work the next day. That for me is heartbreaking. I respect and admire that person's loyalty, but I don't want anybody to have to work in pain. And that, that's just unacceptable, intolerable. We, need, we have to find a way to make sure that everybody knows about the resources that are already available to get you an ergonomic assessment, a virtual one in your house, to make sure you have the monitor or the laptop or the mouse or the, sorry, the keyboard or the mouse. And we even have um, it set up now so that people can get chairs or desks delivered to their house. That doesn't solve the problem completely because can you get that desk into your house, right? The delivery people probably aren't coming in. Can you get the chair? Chairs aren't always light but we're doing more and as much as we can to try to address those concerns. Is Berkeley managing change well? More than 80%, 85% of the respondents agree. And this is tremendous because in our annual employee engagement survey that we got the results from that was run last, that what we did it last April, about 50, 54% of employees said that Berkeley manages change well. So if you had just read that, you would have thought this organization doesn't know how to manage change at all. And somehow, in six months, we managed to greatly enhance our ability. And now, you know, 80% of people agree. And so I think this is really is a testament to, to what everybody is doing to, to make this happen. Um, another cartoon here, a gentleman comes to the doctor's office to get tested for coronavirus, and he's completely relieved. The doctor says, good news, you don't have coronavirus. But then he still wants to be quarantined from his children. Maybe some of us can empathize with that. The next question was, is Berkeley communicating change around the outbreak? Well, again, 90% of people agree that we are communicating well about the outbreak. There's room for improvement. A couple of the things we're thinking about is should we have a weekly wrap-up email that maybe gets sent on a Friday or on a Monday that says, here's all of the relevant news that was shared with you this week. 
We're also looking at changing up the layout and function of our UC Berkeley coronavirus information page. That page was put together very quickly and it has all the information there, but it's not always so easy to use. And so we're looking at changes for how to make it more user friendly so that if you have any question related to coronavirus, whether it's facilities or people and culture that you start there and it routes you to the right place. This last question for me was the most important one. Does UC Berkeley care about my well-being? And again, close to 90% of the respondents agree. And that's where I think um, when I started just in my six months sort of trying to feel, you know, what is it like in Berkeley, that I think people care, but do people, are people able to work in a way that actually supports their well-being? Some of you may recall that I sent out a meet an email in January inviting, call it, calling on people to take care of themselves and to do their well-being. You know, if you can't do the work, tell your manager that you can't do it. You know, and I challenged everybody to take a lunch with a colleague one day in the, in the semester. So for me, this is a priority. And I think this, you know, and when I talk to senior leadership, they definitely care about people, but it's very, I don't know, satisfying, I guess, to know that people actually feel that leadership cares about them. And my last picture, for those of you who saw Lord of the Rings, you'll recognize this as Schmoog, who was trying to steal the rings. And this in Germany, this, this mein Schatz basically means my precious. And instead of it, the ring, it is a roll of toilet paper. Okay, so the action items. How do we pick these things? No Friday afternoon meetings. So one of the common themes in the comments was, I'm burned out, I can't sit in front of my computer anymore. It's too much, it's too much, it's too much. And by Friday afternoon, people's brains are just fried. I personally can attest to that. And so we said, let's try no Friday afternoon meetings. We debated, we let departments pick their own days. Well, if we let every department pick its own day, then you have some on Monday, some Tuesday, Wednesday, and it ends up people are going to meetings all the time anyway. Nobody really gets a break. So we thought Friday afternoon was a more natural break. It's not Friday afternoons off. It's a chance for you to work on your own, to maybe catch up on your emails that you couldn't look at during the week, maybe just connect informally with a colleague. Or maybe you, take the, maybe you do take the afternoon off, you take vacation time and you go to the supermarket during the day or you just take a walk around the block. But we wanted people to have a dedicated block of time that they could use in the best, in the best way for them. So that's how we ended up on the Friday afternoons. For me, I would like this to be something that we carry over when we do come back to work more regularly and more normally on campus because I, I did observe that people were so busy during the day, they didn't often have time to connect with their colleagues informally, whether it was to go for lunch or go grab a coffee. People who wanted to participate in staff organizations and communities of practice, they had to decide between going to my work meeting or going to this other meeting, which is also important. And so this would set a block of time when people know, hey, if I wanna catch up with a colleague Friday afternoon, that, that's the time when I can do that. That's the time when I can do that. So my hope is that, that this works and that it's something that carries over. The second bullet talking about adjustment of work demands is really thinking about giving ourselves permission not to be as good as we were. So we know from neuroscience that because of the pandemic and all of the fears that it creates is that we become a little bit more primitive in our thinking. And as we become more primitive in our thinking, we become less creative, our cognitive ability is impaired. So not only are we less able to do work because we might be managing loved ones or we had to wait in the supermarket for two hours or we have our kids at home, but the quality of our work is reduced as well because we just can't think as straight. Some of us may be on edge, some of us may be stressed out, some of us may be burned out, depressed. That also imp impacts our ability to work. So we have to adjust our expectations for ourselves and for those of us who manage, we also have to adjust the expectations of what other people are, are able to do. This is a, this I think we can all understand and agree. Yeah, that makes sense. I should be more understanding. I want others to be more understanding. But what we still hear from time to time is that when, it, when we're in the heat of the moment, if I can call it that, is that I really want an answer to this question. Sometimes we forget that, that person might have three kids at home that they're trying to make sure that they still learn. And so you send that email or that text and say, hey, I'm still waiting, I haven't heard from you, right? And that's where we have to, and where I'm asking people to, to pause and try and show empathy and put yourself in the shoes of other people and really ask yourself, you know, what is going on with that person why they haven't responded? Maybe, maybe they can't get to it. 
because I believe that most of the employees who work here work here because they want to and because they care and they want to do the best job possible. They're just not gonna, we're not going to just blow each other off. We normally have a good reason for why something doesn't get done. Or maybe because our minds are so preoccupied with so many things, we just forgot. And a gentle reminder, you know, to use that nudge function that they have in Google, you know, maybe all that somebody needs. Ergonomic support, I talked about that already. Again, it's important. Nobody should be working in pain. Uh, reimbursement for remote work expenses. This is not a new thing, but apparently it wasn't clear to people that if you buy paper or toner or now you have to get an enhanced internet at your home, that these are things that the district needs to be paying, the district, sorry, thinking my old job, that the university should be paying for. Just like if you go on a business trip, that's a business expense. Buying paper to use at home to do your job because we've told you to go home, that's similarly a business, business expense. Access to offices. So this came up a lot in the comments where people, I forgot something, I wanna go grab it, I need to go water that plant I've been taking care of for my entire career. Lots of good reasons to go back to the office, but we have shelter in place orders. We wanna maintain social distancing. So we are exploring the ways of, is there a way where we can in an orderly fashion, allow people to go back to the office? Maybe now you've been working at home for six weeks and you're like, I can barely see, I need my monitor. I wanna just go grab my monitor. It doesn't make sense for me to buy one. Can we coordinate that? It takes a lot of coordination to do. A monitor is $115. Maybe it makes more sense for people to buy these sorts of peripherals and all of them because as I imagine it, work, working from home is gonna be much more common, not in response to pandemics, but just now that we've tried it as a university and people seem to be okay and no business units have imploded, I think people are becoming more comfortable with the idea of, yeah, it's okay for my employees to work two or three days a week from home. We've surveyed, I've surveyed now about 350 people to ask the question, how many days a week would you like to work from home? And most people say, you know, about 70% of the respondents say between two and three. And in our next campus-wide employee survey, we're gonna ask people about working from home. And managers who I've asked say, I'd be comfortable with my employees working two or three days a week from home. So as I think about that, we still want people, you know, even if you're only working two or three days, a week from home, I still want you to have the proper setup at home. So maybe you will have a monitor at home and one at work. You know, these are things that we're thinking about. Communications, I mentioned that before, manager training. So on May 6th, we're going to have a manager's forum where we're going to talk about things COVID-19 related. And it really is going to be focused on what sort of, you know, providing support to managers to help them get some tips and some tools so that they can manage their teams. Uh, more effectively during now, but really what it comes down to is what I say three words, ask, listen, and do. You sit with your team and you ask them, what can I do as your manager to support you better? Is it you need a more flexible work schedule so that you can spend time with your children or the grocery store, you want to go there to beat the line? What can I do as your manager to make that happen? Listen to what it is. So now I'm asking you what I can do. I actually need to really listen, right? It's not just I ask them, you need to listen, and then you need to do whatever it is that you can and be honest about what you can and can't do, what the limitations are. So that's it for the formal portion of my presentation. And now I will open it up to questions. Hi, everyone. Thank you for putting your questions into the chat. Uh, we are almost at 200 viewers now. So bravo. Thank you for being here. And uh, Eugene, I've been taking uh, notes on the chat, and so I will bring to your attention the ones that have not already been answered by others on the chat. So, um, for example, Sasha wrote, related to remote work expenses, what about items purchased before the communication? Are they still reimbursable? I yeah, so talk, talk about, so that's a good question. So let me tell you how it got to be written that way. So I had originally written it, you know, if you, had, if you had to purchase something to work remotely and it was reasonable, you will be reimbursed. But then somebody said, well, people have very, very different definitions of what reasonable is. And that is true because I've had some people say, they, I've had, I won't give examples, but I'll leave it at that. And so I changed the language to say, you should have a conversation with your supervisor before you incur expense. But of course, if you bought things that were on that list, the toner, the paper, you had to change your cell phone plan. Yeah, those are all, as I said, those, these things were reimbursable before, right? It just wasn't clear to people. Okay, and we have a question from Mariana. What about no meetings at lunchtime either? Some departments are holding lunch meetings, so no break. 
Yeah. So this is, so what I hope that happens with this. So, okay. So first of all, I'm guilty of doing that because I have a virtual brown bag lunch on Fridays. So it's not mandatory. I provide some updates. And this is where I hope in conversations with managers, they ask their teams, what is it that you need? What would work best for you? Meetings at lunch in general, even before this, I, I would say I would discourage them. People need a break during the day. People need to get out and lunch is in the middle of the day. But, you know, if you're exempt or an hourly employee, you should have time to go and get lunch. And you shouldn't feel obliged to come and, and do it. I would like to think that my virtual brown bags are fun and people come because they like to. I could be wrong. <laughs> I will admit that. Um, but, you know, if, so to Mariana, I would say suggest to your supervisor, maybe this time, maybe this isn't the best time for everyone. And really what, what you would ideally do with your team is that you would work out what times do we feel like we all need to actually overlap to get our work done? Is it every day from 10 to one? Is it every day from two to five that the team comes to an agreement of when they all need to overlap and sort of be at their computers and be available? And then beyond that, everybody's schedule is flexible to get the work done. Because really for most of our jobs, it should be outcome based. It's here's what you need to do, get it done. I kind of don't care when you do it, but I do care about being able to talk to you during these times that we've agreed upon when we should overlap. Thank you. We have a couple questions that came in about administrative leave. Can it be used for a mental health day or burnout prevention? And can it be used for time off because of ergonomic issues? So mental health day, yes, for sure. Burnout prevention, mental health day, I would call those the same thing. And what was the third one? Uh, the third one was ergonomic issues. Ooh, this is interesting. So what I'm thinking about COVID related illness, if I am working at home because I was forced to by COVID and now I'm having injury to my wrist because I'm, is that COVID related? I don't want to give a blanket yes to that, but I also won't say no. My inclination is to say that seems reasonable to me. If I'm all stressed out because of what COVID is doing to me and I take a mental health day, I am all physically injured because of what COVID, they seem similar to me, but I, I would like to reserve the right to see the specific situation before saying a blanket yes, but I won't say, you know, no out of the question. Okay, and Michelle writes, will there be new guidelines released for the performance evaluations that have been postponed to June? For example, will the time period being evaluated include March, April, and May? And will special efforts in response to COVID be recognized? So the time period hasn't changed. So it's still the period ending March 31st that we announced you know, several times. So that hasn't changed. And that new time period, April, May, and June, will be part of the next review cycle that begins when the entire campus is using Achieve Together. Okay, and the follow up to our previous question about administrative leave, uh, Rebecca asked, can the information on mental health days be sent to managers? Because she's heard managers deny this usage. <laughs> so, and th this has actually come up in conversations with the chief of staff or the chancellor that some people say yes, some people say no. I've consistently said yes, and we provided training to the HR network where I said yes. This, will, this is actually an item on the agenda for the managers forum May 6th, but we're also thinking about sending out a message to make it clear. Um, and so, so that you know how we think about these things. So, every, so senior leadership agrees, mental health day, COVID leave, no problem. There are other UCs that are doing this. So it's not a question of are we allowed to, but the question of how do we communicate this? Do we just send out an email to everybody? People are saying we're getting too many emails. People are saying, you know, how, how do we do it? So this is the conversation now. So for me personally, I would like to prefer to communicate this to managers and supervisors first at the manager's forum so we can have a conversation around it and then by email. Now, that's May 6th, people might need it now. And so it's not, a, you can use it now, you could have used it last week. So I'm trying to figure out, well, do we need to send out a message this Friday? you know, or, or on Wednesday or, or Thursday so that people know already or is enough, for example, to communicate here and if people say, Eugene said it's allowed. If you, if you don't agree with it, question him. It, these are, you know, they're not easy decisions to make. Okay, a question from Sarah. 
of the survey respondents who responded bad or not so great, what percentage revealed the department they work in? With the potential of layoffs on the horizon, many people don't feel comfortable revealing that they aren't doing well or responding to surveys. So what percentage reveal, uh, I think almost everybody revealed the department of the people who are surveyed revealed the department that they work in. And so we we're able to look at the analysis of the results. I think in, in what I share with the campus even, it's, uh, it says at least by division, bad and not bad, but everybody revealed the, revealed the department that, but that doesn't mean that we're actually gonna go to a department and say, hey, 10 of your employees said that they're doing bad. I don't, it depends on how many people are in the department and what the numbers look like because we, we don't want people to be identified. So for example, we have individual comments from people and we can tell what department you came from because you responded to the question. We're not going to go to the department and share with them those comments because they might be able to identify the person. So the integrity of the survey is very important. All right, and another survey related question. What survey tool was used for the employee morale survey? Qualtrics. Qualtrics, great. And that's a free one, right? Uh, well, the campus pays for it, but anybody on campus can use it. That's what I meant. <laughs> Thank you, Lori, for that question. Uh, let's see, Andrea writes a survey related question. Was there an effort to collect responses from people without computer access? Yes, so we provided paper surveys in Spanish and English through the Division of Student Affairs and Facilities, since that's where most of the people are continuing to come on campus. And we did get, I wanna say maybe, 50, up to 50 responses, we didn't get very many. Okay, and Raquel writes, since parents of school-aged and or special needs children have different challenges, could there be a specific group to address this? A specific group? I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. She says that it, she, there's some folks interested from the advising matter got kids meeting. I think Raquel's asking if um, like a community of practice could be established or something for parents of school age kids. Well certainly communities of practice and other organizations on campus um, are created around people who have shared interests so that I wouldn't see why not. And Steve writes, can we leverage ITCS purchasing for some stock items like monitors or maybe a small range of ergo mice and keyboards? They have already created a really good no touch handoff system. So if you go to the Be Well at Work website and their ergonomics section, they, you can click through to purchase these peripheral devices and they have already made arrangements with suppliers and it could be delivered directly to your home. Excellent. Okay, and a question from Anne. What are you thinking will be the biggest challenges as we move forward into the summer and fall when people may still be working at home more than usual? I think for the biggest challenge for people is just the mental strain of working from home while dealing with the pandemic. I think that is the biggest challenge. There are, and this is why it's so important for us to encourage our managers to be flexible in, in their expectations of what people do and also when they do it. That, that's sort of the most that we can do. Then when we, when we start thinking about coming to campus, who's gonna come back to campus? I think the default is if you can continue working from home, please continue working from home so that, for those, so that on campus and in our offices, people can maintain social distancing. So if we have an office of 20 people, and 15 people can continue to work from home, then we can have five people spread out to the office and maintain social distancing. Some of the other things we're thinking about are, do we require people to have their temperature taken before they come into a building? You know, there are questions about the accuracy of thermometers. There are also questions about people just sitting in their car with ice on their head and then coming and getting their temperature taken. Does it really work? And so these, are, you know, but then we're looking at, okay, do we have staggered work shifts for people who come into offices? So all of these ideas are sort of on the table. And, we're, and it's not just me and three people in a room thinking about this. Various groups on campus are thinking about this. And we're also looking at what people are doing at other organizations to try to figure out how this works. A big question is going to be how many students are going to come back and be on campus? And you know, some schools are saying, we're only going to let our freshmen come back, or just our freshmen and our seniors. 
We're going to have in our dormitories that were triple occupied, they're going to be double occupancy or they'll only be single occupancy. So all of these things are up in the air. And frankly, for the dormitory issue, to me, it's kind of silly for single occupancy. What, what is it that we're actually accomplishing? Because they're 18 to 22 year olds. If you walk in your communities now, you see what the 18 to 22 year olds are doing. Social distancing doesn't exist for them, right? And then to come and have them in a dorm, we can close off all the public areas and encourage people to maintain social distancing guidelines. So then we're going to drive them into their rooms together. I just, it seems to me completely impractical to try to expect that, that particular population to maintain social distancing. So what do you accomplish if you have singles versus doubles versus triples? If there's an outbreak, fewer people get infected. And that might, that in and of itself might be a worthy goal, but it, it's difficult to say what the right thing is to do. And certainly the public health guidance as it stands today doesn't prevent us from opening up our dorms and letting them be full. And when you also consider that most of our students live off campus in apartments, they're not living one student to a room. So, it's, it's, it's very tricky. Uh, Michelle commented on the earlier question about a uh, group for parents of school-aged children. She said there does exist a support group for Cal parents of teens and tweens. And so if you want, if anyone on this uh, video conference want to contact Michelle, look at the chat, and her, she put her email there. Uh, let's see. There was a question from Lisa that Jesse partially answered in the chat, but I wanted to bring it to your attention to Eugene. Uh, where appropriate, are you sharing specific slices of data with schools and divisions and asking them to focus on their employees well being. Yeah, so absolutely. And Jesse is correct. And so what I'm working with Sharon Inkless, who's the faculty advisor for sexual violence, sexual harassment, but she's also very involved in um, community issues and employee well-being. So she and I are, are collaborating to put together a, a, a overall report and we've already looked at the results by division. And so we'll be communicating with all of the deans and saying, here's what it looks like in your division. And here are some things that we think you can do to help improve your employees well-being. So that was something that we'd always intended to do from the start, which is why we set up the survey so that we could ask people's departments. And so to the extent that we know that once we share that debate data about the, at the division level, there may be some deans who come back and say, well, what does it look like in particular departments? Because somebody came to me and then we'd be in a position to provide some of that data as well. As Jesse said, depending on what it looks like, we might not be able to provide demographic data because it might reveal people's identities, but we could provide certainly overall data. All right, and then Sasha writes regarding work from home tools. Each team seems to be adapting different technology. Will there be streamlining of these efforts and trainings? So this is an interesting question because I noticed even within people and culture, some people use, for example, Google Drive, some people use Box. And, and I said, how can this be? We should all be using the same thing. And some people love one thing, some people love another. If you, take, if you try to take something away, there'll be a revolution. So I, okay. So, and if you talk to ISNT, they'll say, yeah, we should all be using the same things so that we, as from their perspective for support and security reasons, it makes more sense. But again, our campus is so huge and so many people are committed, like some people use Google Hangouts, some people use Zoom. Do we really need to use both? I would tend to say no, but people feel more comfortable. And so some of it is then from customer service, do we want to allow people to make their own choices and give them some people like vanilla, some people like chocolate. You know, so we, we try to streamline and encourage where we can, but I, I think we are very hesitant at Berkeley to, in some respects, to tell people what to do. I like vanilla. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> You're doing great. I, I do not like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. I know I'm just giving you question after oh, question. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, the next one is from Dana. During this time of significant revenue loss, will the units be expected to pay for increased sanitation, building entrance monitoring, and workstations at home, and similar options so that we can have a hybrid return? So this is a very good question. Who is going to pay? And we don't have the answer right now. I am also asking who's going to pay because centrally there isn't some big, you know, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that, oh, well now we'll dust it off and use it. No, 
But we also know that some divisions have more money than others that they have in their unrestricted reserves, they've saved or they've received donations, some divisions are hurting financially. So I don't really know what the answer is in terms of where is all of the money going to come from, but the things that you identify there are things that we have to have, just like the ergonomics. You know, even if your division is hurting financially, you can't say, oh, we don't have any money. You don't get the keyboard that you need. Good luck to the workers' comp, right? We're not going to tell people that. It just has to happen. Some of these things just have to happen. And so then the campus, the financial folks at the campus are, gonna, are the ones who are ultimately going and with the chancellor and the executive vice chancellor are the ones who are gonna make decisions about where the money comes from. All right, and can you please share more about the disproportionate impacts of the current situation on different populations of staff at Berkeley? So I think the disproportionate impact would be the staff who have to continue to come to work, and that's our custodial staff and our dining staff and, and who support housing and dining services. So part of the reason we did the paper surveys is that I wanted to capture the responses from those staff because they were continuing to come on campus. And so we got limited responses, but the responses we got were mixed. I would say, you know, you know, we think the campus is trying, but we're very afraid that I'm going to catch something because I'm coming to work every day and bring it home to my family. And that's really, really tough, right? We need you. You have to keep coming to work and continue to put your family at risk. We're going to give you a mask and gloves and we'll clean but it still doesn't take away that fear and it doesn't eliminate that risk, right? We're following all of the guidelines from the public health authorities. We're doing everything at, you know, we're not just doing the minimum, we're, do, we're doing everything we can, but still that, there's that anxiety that's caused. And so that, that's, that's the population that's disproportionately impacted. And at some point there's going to be something to, uh, some sort of a special acknowledgement. So you may not be aware, but when we had the power outages in the fall, Again, the facility staff, they were the ones working around the clock to get the power back up, the cogeneration plant. And, and they, they, were, they received special acknowledgement. And so when this started back in March, everybody agreed, we're gonna have to do something for them. We didn't know then that it was gonna last this long. So whatever we did for the power outages would, would not be sufficient. And I, I don't, and I can't say that we're planning a pizza party or we're planning to give them each $10,000. I have no idea what it is but they're at a minimum some sort of special acknowledgement for the people who continue to come to work and the people who are coming to our health center to continue to work and provide services. You know, they're, they are on the front lines as well. That, that said, you know, I don't want to underestimate the sacrifice that people are making when they're at home and they have kids that they're taking care of because their kids aren't in school and they're still continuing to work too. They're maybe not risking their health, let's say, I don't know, if, you know, I don't want to go out and say people are risking their health by coming to work. I don't know if that's true, but they're making a different kind of sacrifice that in some ways deserves the same level of recognition because they're having to be teacher and employee. And what ISNT reported is that they're service tickets. So when you need help, you submit a service ticket. Their service tickets for after hours and on the weekends are through the roof because that's when people are working. So I'm imagining there are a lot of people who are spending, you know, I'm, I'm halfway working, halfway taking care of my kids. They're finally asleep. Now I'm gonna go do my job and be awake until one or two o'clock in the morning, right? What, what sort of special acknowledgement do those people get? They need something as well. Agreed. Uh, okay, Effie writes, is there already a conversation with the represented labor regarding their scheduled loss of cost of living adjustment? So the university president, uh, UC president, Janet Napolitano, sent a letter to the unions either this week or last week saying, we'd like to have a conversation about the negotiated cost of living adjustment and see what we can do in light of the fact that UC system-wide has already lost $590 million of revenues. And so I think the conversation is going to take place next week or the week after. The chair of the Board of Regents, Perez, is going to be involved in that conversation as well. So I think you know, everybody's going to have to sacrifice something for us to get through. And thinking about sacrifices, can you address people's concerns about furloughs and layoffs? How so, likely are they? Sure, so I, I can't, so there haven't been any plans yet made for layoffs. There isn't a secret plan that we're gonna dust off and on July 1st, you'll see an email saying, well, you made it to June 30th and welcome to July, no, that's not gonna happen. 
we do routinely do summer furloughs in housing and dining because the population of students in the dormitories decreases in the summer. And so that's something that's routine and those things will continue to happen. The employees in those jobs know that when they get hired that these are the things that happen. So that's not anything related to COVID-19. Now, when we talk about all of the revenue losses, we have to make up the money somewhere. We've been cutting back on the staff side so much, we're still pretty lean. And when you think about, we're still providing the full range of services. And if students come back in the fall, even in limited numbers, we're gonna have to provide the full range of services. So then where would you lay people off or cut, right? It's not obvious to me that there's a, a swath of the population that doesn't, we don't need anymore. So what people are doing now is they're looking at everything that we did in 2008 and 2009 when we had the financial crisis. And then we asked, there, I think I've heard various stories and they may all be true, but there was voluntary early retirement, maybe with some incentives, people who voluntarily reduced their time. So maybe I went on 90% time and so I had an extra day off. Then there were also furloughs where people were said, you have to take off a day a month or two days a month or three days a month and get less paid. So all of these things now are currently possibilities. Some people have asked about borrowing money. UC Berkeley can't just go borrow money on its own. It's not an independent legal entity for those purposes. It's University of California. So we would need to get special permission if we were to do that for me personally, right? I'm not the financial person, so I'm not in charge, but I would love to see us borrow a bunch of money to, to get through this period of time because I believe it's a blip and that, you know, assuming that we really do get a vaccine within a year or less, that we will be really functioning normally, maybe with enhanced cleaning everywhere, which means more staff. But, you know, so I don't see layoffs in the immediate future, maybe pay cuts through fur the furlough process. I could imagine something like that happening. But in terms of the when, I I'm not sure. I think on campus, we're trying to, and part of that reason why I don't know when is because a lot of what we do is going to be driven by how many students are going to be on campus, which is in turn driven by enrollment. Students had May 1st to, to submit whether or not they plan to attend. We'll get better visibility on who's really going to be here in the fall over the course of May. So I would envision end of May, middle of June, we'll have a better idea of who do we need to work to continue to support the campus and what's our financial situation going to be in light of tuition revenue that we may or may not have from non-resident students this fall. Okay, and a couple follow-on questions to uh, furlough. If you're furloughed, how does that impact retirement vesting? So just so I can be clear, there is no current furlough plan. So to answer that question, I will speculate. And remember, I'm a lawyer too, so I'm trying to be very careful. And so last time around in 2008 and 2009, what they said is that when they did furloughs, you would be held harmless. So even if you might be working 95% time for retirement purposes, they looked at it, treated it as if you worked 100% time. Okay, and is there going to be an early retirement incentive? Maybe. So I've heard mixed reviews of that. So I heard that the people who did the early retirements loved it, but that financially it was a disaster that they made, they made the deal too sweet. So I, I don't know about this time around. Okay, and another question about uh, getting ergonomic equipment to home. Can you share how to access getting your desk chairs delivered to your home? So, so you, if you do it, go to the Be Well at Work website, and there you can, you can contact them to do a virtual ergonomic assessment, and so they'll look through your webcam and with your permission, of course, to look at your setup and recommend desk or chair. And then through them, it gets ordered and shipped to your house. All right, we're coming down to our last few questions. Uh, one from Vanessa is, if you were to speculate on the top three to four things that are going to permanently be part of our new normal, what would these be? I'm glad you phrased that, Vanessa, as speculate, because I do like to speculate. New norm, top three things, new normal, remote from work, or sorry, remote, work from home. I mix the two. You see, my brain isn't functioning fully either. Work from home is going to be a much more regular part of what we do, not because of a pandemic, but because Berkeley is now seeing that it works. I think there were in different pockets on campus, people were afraid. What happens if I can't see my employee working? They're not going to work. I think, I think we're over it. And so 
two to three days a week, people working from home will become much more routine. Um, what, uh, what are the other things? I would like to see that this Friday afternoon free, um, free from meetings, I would like to see that continue. So I'm going to speculate and say that will continue in some form. It might, be con it might not be every Friday, it might be first Fridays of every month that that happens. So that will be the second thing. Third thing um, th that might happen is that we might also just have a week that we designate every semester where we do hybrid learning, where classes become online for a week and you know students you know do it from their dorm rooms or they, they travel and do it, but that, that might just become a regu regular feature of the curriculum. That was actually a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> But a good one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, going back to the previous question, uh, Raquel asks, are there any thoughts about bringing back the employee initial reduction in time, the ERIT program, to help save yeah. Yes, and so this is what I was talking about, about having employees voluntarily say, hey, I only want to work 90%. So that's something that people have talked about. And Vera, I see the next comment there, Vera was several years ago, that was the five-year service credit, which was super expensive. Yeah, this was the one that was, everybody liked it, but it was a disaster financially. Yeah. Okay, uh, two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, earlier you said that you were planning to run the survey again in mid-May. Uh, question is, will it, repeat it, will it be repeated again after that? And if so, how often? So, let me answer that question a little bit more broadly. So I wanted to be running poll surveys every quarter, but I got a lot of pushback um, that this, this campus doesn't like to answer surveys because we never do anything with them and people are just pissed. And I could understand if you ask me a bunch of questions, but nothing happens, I wouldn't answer either. But hopefully we've demonstrated that we ask questions and we take an action. And so I would like, at least for now, while we're out, so I'm going to do it in May and June. And what, what you'll eventually see probably in June is a separate survey specifically about working from home where we really want to dig into, you know, how many days a week, what days a week, would you be willing to share your cubicle or office with somebody else and sort of a hoteling setup if we needed to do that to facilitate, you know, greater work from home. So that, so we will continue to do that when we come back to quote unquote normal. I don't know that we would be doing it every month. That might be too much, maybe once a quarter. Um, or twice a year. So right now, the annual, the biannual employee engagement survey, right? So that's every two years, and we then we go two years without asking you about Berkeley and what your experience is. That's too long. And so the survey, I think I mentioned at the beginning of this call that we were planning to launch something already in April, and that was going to be our survey to alternate with the system-wide survey. So certainly we're going to do that, and I wanted to do that twice a year, once a year, ask more comprehensive sets of, set of questions in April, so it would be longer. And then in the fall, in October, ask a shorter set of questions. So I, that was like a really confusing answer. So for now, we are going to go on a monthly sort of cadence, but longer term, I can see us doing something every six months. Yeah, are you ready to wrap up? All right, and then uh, a last question. Will there be another one of these sessions after the next survey? People are really enjoying getting this FaceTime with you, Eugene. Well, if you will have me back, I will happily do it. <laughs> but, but with the caveat that please do not misquote me. When I was speculating, I was speculating because I, I did one of these, not with this group, not with this esteemed and honorable and trustworthy group, but some other group. And I saw that I, and I was in another conversation where I wasn't talking, but I was watching the chat. And somebody said, Eugene said that layoffs were inevitable. How could Eugene have said that? So, so if you're not sure about something that I said, or if you need a little clarification, feel free to shoot me an email. I don't mind at all. I, I really do actually like my job. I like engaging with people. So I'm happy to t answer your emails and I'm happy to do this again as well. That's great. You did a great job on answering all of those many, many questions. I can't even, uh, I, I was keeping track, something like 25 questions in 25 minutes. So bravo. Uh, that's what we'll call this the next time, 25 questions in 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you again for being here, Eugene. I'm gonna toss it back to Sierra to wrap us up. Sierra, are you there?
Hi, sorry. I have uh, <laughs> some, a situation similar to Eugene. I have a, a baby and a three-year-old and a first responder spouse. So things are kind of going crazy at my house right now. Um, uh, thank you, Eugene, for joining us. It was really uh, an, a special treat to hear from you. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you again. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we got up to 203 participants for this meeting. So that's a huge BPOG uh, can uh, showing. And thank you all for joining us. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eugene.